Hi, I'm Chris Rycroft and welcome to Harvard Applied Math 205, a graduate course in scientific computing and numerical methods. In the previous video in this series, we looked at using the Newton method to solve optimization problems. While the Newton method had excellent convergence properties, we noted that there were some difficulties with using it for optimization. In particular, it required the complete Hessian of the function that we were trying to optimize, and that could be very difficult and expensive to compute in some cases. Here, we're going to look at the family of quasi-Newton methods that don't require the Hessian information and instead build up an approximation to the Hessian over time. The general form of a quasi-Newton method to perform unconstrained optimization on a function f is as follows. We write that xk plus 1 is equal to xk minus alpha k times bk inverse times grad f of xk. And here, alpha k is a line search parameter and bk is some approximation to the Hessian of f. And we can see here that if alpha k is equal to 1 and bk exactly matches the true Hessian of f, then this update formula would exactly give us Newton's method. And quasi-Newton methods generally lose the quadratic convergence of Newton's method. However, superlinear convergence is often achieved. And we'll now look at a few specific quasi-Newton methods. And a very popular choice is the Broyden fletcher goldfarb shano method, or BFGS method, that is defined as follows. We choose an initial guess x0, and we choose b0 to be the initial guess of our Hessian. So, for example, we might choose b0 equal to the identity matrix. Then we loop over steps k from 0, 1, 2, and so on. And we first solve bk sk is equal to minus grad f of xk to find our step sk. And we then find our updated solution, xk plus 1, as equal to xk plus sk. We then calculate yk as grad f of xk plus 1 minus grad f of xk. And we then update our approximate Hessian, bk plus 1 is equal to bk plus delta bk. And I've written the formula for the update of delta bk, and it involves yk, sk, and bk. And at first glance, this seems like a rather complicated formula. But we'll now take a look at where this comes from. And to do this, we'll first take a step back and we'll look at a simpler case of the Broyden root finding method that will contain the key idea. Once we've looked at this, then we'll look at exactly where the BFGS update comes from. Broyden's method is a way to find roots of systems of nonlinear equations without evaluating the Jacobian. And to illustrate this method, let's first look in one dimension at a scalar function f, and we're going to find roots f of x equals 0 without evaluating the derivative. And we've already seen how to do this previously in the course, and we can use the secant method. And suppose that we have a solution xk and a previous solution xk minus 1, then we can draw a straight line through these two points and use that line to approximate the derivative of f at xk. So we'll have that our approximate derivative is equal to f of xk minus f of xk minus 1 divided by xk minus xk minus 1. Once we have this, then we can evaluate our next step, xk plus 1, using a Newton step, but instead of using the exact derivative, we'll make use of our approximation. If we think about generalizing this to more than one dimension, it's first worth multiplying through our expression for our approximate derivative by xk minus xk minus 1, and then we have a form for this expression that looks a little like a linear system. So suppose now that we try and generalize to n dimensions. So we have a function capital F from Rn to Rn, and we might first try and find an approximate Jacobian, Jk, using the previous step. So generalizing our previous form, we might write down Jk 
times xk minus xk minus 1 is equal to f of xk minus f of xk minus 1. And once we have this Jacobian, then we could advance to the next step using xk plus 1 is equal to xk minus jk inverse f of xk. Unfortunately, there's a problem with this first step. And if we are working with n greater than 1, then this equation will be underdetermined. The problem is that we're solving for a n by n matrix jk, but we only have n equations. And this makes sense. If we make a step from xk minus 1 to xk, then we can only observe how the function changes along the line connecting xk minus 1 to xk, whereas the Jacobian contains more information. However, this still seems like a good direction to go in, and we'll see how we can modify this approach to gain a workable algorithm. So let's now define delta xk to be equal to xk minus xk minus 1, and delta fk to be equal to f of xk minus f of xk minus 1. Then our underdetermined system for our approximate Jacobian reads jk times delta xk is equal to delta fk. And the key idea in Broyden's method is that rather than calculating jk completely at each step, we build up jk with additional information on each successive step. So each step we construct jk from the previous one that we had, but we modify it to be consistent with our new underdetermined system that's labeled star. And one formula that can do this is written down here. We can calculate jk in terms of jk minus 1, our previous step, and then our factors of delta fk and delta xk. And it can be shown that this choice is consistent with our equation star, and in addition, this minimizes the Frobenius norm between jk and jk minus 1, and therefore represents the minimal change that we could make to our approximate Jacobian. There are other choices that can also be made for how we can update jk, but we'll focus on this formulation here. The complete Broyden's method therefore consists of two steps. We first update the approximate Jacobian, computing jk in terms of jk minus 1, and we then advance the next step, computing xk plus 1 using jk. And if we look at this method, then we can see that we only require jk inverse in order to find xk plus 1. And for efficiency, we could consider whether it's possible to just store and update jk inverse directly instead. This would result in a substantial computational improvement because inverting jk at every step is currently an expensive operation, particularly when the dimension of our problem becomes large. In order to do this, though, we would need to rewrite our update to the approximate Jacobian in terms of jk inverse instead. And at first sight, this doesn't seem very straightforward. However, if we look at the update that we are applying, then we can see that we're actually making a rank 1 adjustment to jk. We can see that this factor can be written as u times v transpose for two vectors u and v. And there's a useful identity referred to as the Sherman-Morrison formula that allows us to compute matrix inverses when we make this type of adjustment. So suppose that we have a matrix A and we add u v transpose to it. Then the inverse of A plus u v transpose can be written in terms of the inverse of A minus an algebraic expression involving A, u and v. And this algebraic expression can be evaluated rapidly and is much cheaper than doing a complete matrix inverse. So if we use the Sherman-Morrison formula 
for our Broyden update to the approximate Jacobian, then we find that we can rewrite this update in terms of a formula to update the inverse Jacobian that's written down here. Now we can combine this update formula with our step to advance to xk plus 1, and that leaves us with an efficient root finding method that requires no matrix inverses. So we see that the key idea behind the Broyden method is to build up the approximate Jacobian using information gathered over multiple iterations. And we'll now return to the BFGS method for optimization, and we'll see that the same idea can be used there. So in the BFGS method, we begin by looking at the linear system, BKSK is equal to minus grad f of XK, and here BK is our approximate Hessian, SK is our step, and grad f is the gradient of our objective function. And once we've solved this linear system and found SK, then we can calculate our next solution, XK plus one, as equal to XK plus SK. We can also calculate the vector yk, that's the change in the gradient of f between xk and xk plus 1. And yk gives us some information about what we think the Hessian of our function f should be. And we can write down that our updated approximate Hessian should satisfy the underdetermined system bk plus 1 sk is equal to yk. And yk is now measuring the change in the first derivative along the direction given by sk, and that therefore gives us some limited information about what our Hessian should be. And this is similar in form to the underdetermined system that we had for Broyden's method. And we'll call this equation double star. Similar to the approach we took with Broyden's method, we want to make a minimal adjustment to BK in order to satisfy a double star. However, the situation is slightly different from Broyden's method, since we also need to ensure here that BK remains a symmetric positive definite matrix, and we'll therefore try an update using BK plus 1 is equal to BK plus alpha uu transpose plus beta vv transpose. And here, alpha and beta are scalars to be determined, and u and v are vectors to be determined. And this form that we have of uu transpose and vv transpose ensures that the change we make to bk will keep it symmetric positive definite. So, Let's now try putting u is equal to yk and v is equal to bksk. And therefore, we'll obtain that bk plus 1 is equal to bk plus alpha yk yk transpose plus beta bksk sk transpose bk. And here we've used the fact that bk is symmetric and therefore bk transpose equals bk. From our equation double star, we have that yk is equal to bk plus 1 sk, and using our update formula for bk plus 1, we know that we can write this in terms of bk sk plus alpha yk yk transpose sk plus beta bk sk sk transpose bk sk. And we can note that the terms in this equation involve the vectors yk and bksk and we can therefore equate different terms to determine what alpha and beta should be. If we look at the yk term and also the alpha yk yk transpose sk then that tells us that we would require that alpha is equal to 1 divided by yk transpose sk. If we look at the bksk and the term involving beta then we can see that for those terms to match, we would require that beta is equal to minus 1 divided by sk transpose bk sk. And using this, we end up with the update to our approximate Hessian, 
which is given in terms of these two terms. So that gives us our full BFGS method. We would choose our initial guess x0, choose our initial Hessian guess b0, and then perform these steps where we solve this linear system to get our step sk. We calculate our yk that gives us this difference in the gradient of our objective function and then we update our approximate Hessian and this matches the exact form that I showed before we began this derivation. We can also note here that the update that we're doing to our approximate Hessian involves the sum of two rank one terms and therefore we could again apply the Sherman Morrison formula and instead of updating our Hessian, we could update the inverse Hessian instead. If we do this, then we end up with a modified BFGS method, where we begin by choosing our initial guess x0 and our initial inverse Hessian guess h0. And using this, we can now calculate our step sk in terms of matrix multiplication using our matrix HK. And we can then write an update for the inverse approximate Hessian that's shown here. And this follows from applying the Sherman Morrison formula to the original BFGS Hessian update. So this leaves us with a very efficient method for optimizing and finding local minima of a function that doesn't require the exact Hessian of our function. The BFGS method is implemented in the fmin BFGS function in the scipy to optimize module. And in addition, BFGS with a trust region extension is implemented in MATLAB's fmin unc function. And let's now take a look at a Python example, h underscore bfgs.py, that demonstrates the BFGS method. Let's now look at an example of doing BFGS optimization, and we're going to use the Himmelblau function, which is a standard optimization benchmark function. And I'm showing this in the bottom right corner here. The Himmelblau function is a 2D polynomial featuring terms up to the fourth power. On the left here, I'm showing contours of the Himmelblau function with darker blues corresponding to larger function values and we see that there are four isolated local minima. We can calculate the positions of these minima analytically, and the function value is equal to zero at all four minima. For comparison, I've also plotted the results of two previous optimizations that we considered in the previous video. The magenta line shows a typical steepest ascent method optimization, this method has linear convergence properties, and we often see this zigzagging pattern as the method approaches a local minimum. The black line corresponds to an optimization using the Newton method, and this method has quadratic convergence, and we can see that as this method approaches the local minimum, it can curve into the local minimum, and can reach the local minimum in only a few steps. So let's now look at the program h underscore bfgs.py that demonstrates the bfgs method. And we're going to first import the Himmelblau function from a common file that we discussed previously called himmelblau.py. This program implements the Himmelblau function, the Himmelblau function's gradient and also its Hessian. And each of these functions take in the coordinates x and y. For BFGS, we'll just require the function and its gradient, and we won't require the Hessian. So now let's return to h underscore bfgs.py. So we're going to make use of the fmin underscore bfgs routine within scipy.optimize. And this routine requires that the functions we give it take vector inputs for the current position. And I've therefore written two small functions here 
that convert the Himmelblau functions from taking in x and y coordinates to taking in a vector z. So if we look at the function f underscore vec of z, then it will calculate the function value and it will print out the function value and also the current position. We can use this to keep track of the progression of the method and it will then return the function value. Similarly, this function takes in a current position z and returns back the gradient of the Himmelblau function. So we'll then make this call to fmin underscore bfgs. We'll pass it our function f underscore vec. We'll pass it an initial position of minus 1.2 and minus 3. And we'll also pass in the gradient. So let me now go ahead and run this program. So we see that this method converges rapidly and reaches a local minimum after 12 iterations. And let's now go ahead and run this program again and save the results to a temporary file that we can plot. And because I don't want these status messages to appear in the output file, I'm going to adjust the program to stop them from being printed. So let me now plot the contour plot again and overlay the results of the BFGS optimization. And so we see the BFGS optimization in the bottom left corner here. And we can see that it looks somewhat similar to the Newton method in that it can curve into the local minimum. We also see that it is sampling several function values along a straight line. And that is because the fmin bfgs function actually also incorporates a line search component. And that was not something that we looked at in our derivation, but it's something that can be incorporated to improve robustness. So let's now look at quantitatively comparing these three different methods. And I'm now going to plot a semi-log plot showing the function value in terms of the number of iterations. And since the function value is zero at all of our local minima, we can use it to track the progression of the convergence of each method. So we see the three different methods here. And the steepest ascent method has the linear convergence rate where we improve our solution by a constant factor each time. And therefore, in the semi-log plot, our steep ascent points appear as a straight line. Newton has very rapid convergence, indicative of its quadratic convergence rate. And as expected, we find that BFGS has a convergence rate somewhere in between. Typically, we would expect BFGS to have superlinear convergence although not as good as the quadratic convergence of the Newton method. It's also worth briefly mentioning the conjugate gradient algorithm for nonlinear optimization, and this is another alternative to Newton's method that doesn't require the Hessian. In addition, the conjugate gradient method doesn't even require an approximation to the Hessian, and this means that we don't need to track a n by n matrix in the algorithm that can become expensive when n gets large. And we'll defer a full discussion of this algorithm until Unit 5, when the conjugate gradient method will come up in the Krylov method section.